Hi, Shannon. Hi. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, of course. Are you in Portland right now? I am. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Got back. It was a lot of snow, I guess, this last week. So it took me a couple of days to get back after she believes. So, but it's all good. Got back. <laughs> so you're, you're commentating now, right? Yeah. Crazy. That's um, awesome. was not expecting to do any of that stuff and then kind of got the opportunity. I was like, yeah, let's try it. And I actually really like it. Yeah. Kind of I say, is it fun or is it like, do you find yourself getting so into what you're watching? I'd have such a hard time, like <laughs> keeping a professional. Well, so I'm only doing the analyst stuff. So I'm only like pregame halftime post. Um, I did do one of the games. I did the Brazil Japan game, like in the booth. And that's crazy. That's hard. I was, I was like pretty shocked at how difficult that was just because it's so fast. And you are, you're looking over this, you have like three screens in front of you, but you're looking over onto the field and like not to know either team. I was like, I, I'm looking at their numbers. I'm looking at like their cleats colors, like just to try to remember them. But like, you're constantly looking down at the, at the roster just to like know who they are, know how to say their name. Like it was crazy. Pronouncing names must be so like, you have to, oh. you basically have to study and memorize that. Yeah. And we still messed up. I mean, I think I messed up so many times that I was like, whoops, said that one wrong. But the good thing is, is most it's Americans watching. So when you kind of screw up, they have no idea, but yeah. Do you think that being an athlete, you kind of enjoy that pressure situation? Like you thrive under that situation? Um, I mean, no, I mean, if it's something that I feel like I'm really comfortable and good at like soccer, it's easy. And I like the pressure of that. But as soon as it's something that I'm like, like TV, I would never like being in front of the TV or any of that. So it was, you know, a little bit nerve wracking the first two times, but luckily I have like really good people around me. Like DeMarcus is great. Sarah's great. Julie's awesome. And then we have Melissa too, who comes in and like, they make it feel so comfortable. And Julie, you know, just being my teammate for so long, she, I think she backs me up so many times. She's like, yeah, what Shannon said. And she makes me look so good. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> That's a clutch teammate. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And you're also a co-owner of Angel City. That's amazing. Can you tell us more about that? Like, did you always want to be an owner of a club or is that something that just like was sprung upon you? I don't think I even thought about it. Um, I mean, it's just amazing how things have just changed over the years. Right. And, and it's in such a good way. Um, the Angel City thing came up, um, obviously being from California, but it was really funny because Julie wrote me pretty late in the game and was like, oh my gosh, we almost forgot you. And I was like, really? I would have been so mad if I'd found out like all these Southern California people like became owners of Angel City and I was like left out. So I was like, how did you, she's like, well, you're up in Portland now. And like, you just weren't on the list. And I was like, oh my gosh. So it feels pretty awesome just being an owner. And obviously the ownership group has grown, but to be part of that founding group of investors and to know that it's with like other teammates that have also just been pushing for the women's game to be, you know, where it is now and to continue to keep pushing for it. Um, I just think that it's really important and it was really cool that I got to be a part of it. And to be honest right now, it's more of just, um, you know, we get in on, on calls and those things. So Julie and, and Kara are so great about updating us on what's going on at all times, but they are just so busy and they're doing such an amazing job. Like I was, because I'm here in Portland, I was only able to get down to one game last year. Um, this year I plan on being there more often, but, but definitely a season ticket holder and everything that I've heard is just so positive. Um, because I have so many people that do go to the games. Um, and so what a cool environment and just what they're doing off the field, I think is so important. I've felt that all three leagues that I was a part of, it was you're a soccer player and that's it. And we're just going to focus on you on the field, but there's, you know, we all wanted more. We wanted to be, you know, given the opportunity to come into the offices and learn 
you know, that part of it or, or whatever it was, we wanted to grow as people too, not just as like being a soccer player, because we knew that wasn't going to be forever. Um, so I love what Angel City is trying to do and they've accomplished so much and just the things they're doing in the community and making it, um, you know, it's not just a team in your community. It's actually this, this whole, I don't even know what to call it, but like just an awareness and a group. And you're, you're just part of this broader community than just soccer. I think it's been so cool to see so many women become investors and, and owners this year. Like you said, you were like, I didn't even think of it because no. it wasn't a thing. Like <laughs> not many people, not many women were taking that role. So it's so cool. You you're literally paving the way, especially for the younger players. Now, when they retire, like what, what, if they want to stay in the game and stay having like a position like that, it's so important to be still a part of the league and making yeah. a difference based off of your personal experience being a player in the league itself. I would agree with that completely. And just, you know, I, that's the thing. It's we have to kind of continue to pave the way for the younger generation. I think it's always been important on the women's game. I don't see it as much on the men's side. It's like they play, they're done. Like women, like we want to stick together. We really want to help each other out. And I love the idea that we're always constantly bettering it for the next group and the current team right now is doing so much of that what they've been able to accomplish it, and it's not that they came out of the blue it came from all of the other generations really pushing to get it to this point so that then they can now get over that that hump of equal pay and and equal opportunity and so I think they've put it in such a great space that now the next generation just has to continue to push the envelope Sorry, Carl. No, I was just going to say, um, you had spoken before about like how the, gen the generation now, what, what they're doing. Is there anything specific that they've been, like inspired you recently by doing? Oh my gosh. Every day, just, I, I follow them and they're, you know, the, they're using their voices in the right way. And we do, we have this platform that I think we didn't really realize it before, uh, even in my time. I mean, granted, social media has really helped. I think before we didn't have that. So it was a lot more difficult to really voice the things that you believe in and the things that you have, um, you know, a lot of power to kind of change. Um, I know for me with my lupus stuff, that became really important to me in 2012. I'd hidden it for so long. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I have this platform people have no idea what the word lupus means. And so now I can do this and, and I can bring this out into the public. So I just think right now the women want, obviously the equal pay, the equal opportunity stuff was, uh, I mean, amazing. Um, but you're still hearing them, you know, fighting for the Canadian national team that's going through it. I mean, Brazil's going through it. Japan's going through it. Now you're seeing the French team. But I think the important piece is that all the women's teams need to just stick together. And I think they're showing that by showing their support and saying, it's not just, we didn't want this just for the U.S. We wanted this for all women's soccer players all around the world. So I, I would say those are the biggest things that I'm noticing right now um, or that are just in the forefront. It is really cool to see all the teams back each other up like that. Like you don't see that in, like you don't see it in most men's sports. You don't see it in general. So it's really something to, to be. Yeah, it, it'll be very interesting this World Cup. Yeah. I have a feeling that this will be kind of the thing that, you know, all the women that are playing are going to, you know, have mm -hmm. a say. Yeah, so. it's going to be really interesting. You mentioned um, having your own platform to talk about lupus. I'd love to know more about that. My mother-in-law had it. And before that, I really didn't know what it was. So I know just reading about your difficulties, like how you did hide it in 2012. What was that like playing with that? Because just dealing with an injury and not wanting to tell someone is hard. So having an autoimmune disease or having anything that you, you want support to when you're going through that, how did you handle that? And, and once you did come out and talk about it, did, did it feel like a weight lifted off your shoulders? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think when I had to be silent, it's just that so isolating. Um, and you know, when you have kind of these rare diseases where one, it took me six years just to find out that I had lupus. So those years of not knowing and knowing that like my body is not reacting the way it should be reacting. And, and I did feel like I tried to tell somebody, um, I tried to tell coach and I felt like I got punished for it. Um, 
that made me want to hide it even more. And I know that lupus can, you know, it affects all different types of people. And I know that people, even in their own profession, um, in the business world, they have to hide it because people just don't understand it. We look and look normal, but when a flare hits, um, you can feel pretty miserable. And I have a, a, a lot of people that I've met through working with the foundation, you know, when they have internal organs that are they're dealing with, I mean, they can be hospitalized for weeks and months and are going through so much more than I've ever had to go through. Um, but yeah, it's a very isolating and very scary situation. Um, I luckily had a great support system and my doctors and my, and my family knew. Um, and so I could always lean back on them, but being with the national team, you're there, you're together almost 200 days a year. And to know that you could never voice how you were feeling, um, became really tough. And so when I actually opened up in 2012, I had a great response from the coaching staff, which was P at the time. And, um, all the players were so supportive that, I honestly felt like I played the next three years because of that support. And it just was so much easier to say, Hey, I'm not having the best day today. I'm going to try to keep playing, but I might play like crap and, or I might have to actually stop and just, and then I could, you know, like we've all been there. Like even when you're injured, you don't want to tell someone that you're injured, you know, and to have that open line of communication that is, it's okay to, to be honest and tell us we're going to understand and give you that grace to like, take it easy today. And I think that's what I was able to do. And I think that's why I played for so much longer. And you bring up such a good point too, of like when it's a physical injury that you can see and someone's on crutches or someone has a cast on, it's like, oh, this person's very clearly injured and they need the time right. they can to get healthy again. But then, you know, when only you inside of your head know if you're having a good day or a bad day, depending on how you're feeling. It's hard to, I I would be worried about how other people were perceiving that and to what degree, you know, are they believing me? Are they, do they sympathize and and realize that rest will be the best thing for me? So that must've been challenging to navigate for sure. But to have a coaching staff that reacts positively to that is just, yeah. And it's just, I hope now, even I was at the She Believes Cup and there were, you know, a couple like slight little injuries and stuff like that. And like vodka was so great to them to be super open. And it's just such a lesson to learn, like it, as a, as a boss, as a, as a coach, like having that, um, transparency and, and being able to communicate, it's just so much easier than having to hide and and then get hurt even more or whatever it is. And it was really great to see that that, that had evolved at least on the national team um, with the head coach now currently. Yeah. So is lupus an autoimmune disease? Yeah. So lupus is an autoimmune. Yeah. And so it attacks yourself, right? Yeah. So we did actually interviewed a couple of players in the NWSL that have also been dealing with autoimmune disease. And I know that there are so many players listening who might be too. So other than communicating with a coach or being really clear about how you're feeling and what you're going through. Do you have any other tips for players who are dealing with this too? I think it's just really understanding your body. I got really good about that. Um, I could, you know, I started really focusing on when a flare hits, what, have, what was I doing before? What did I feel as it started to come on? Because there were times that I felt like my wrists were a big trigger for me. So I learned really early that my wrists, when they started to start hurting a lot with the joint pain, that it, a flare was probably coming. And so I did, I changed the way I was doing things. I maybe rested more instead of going to the mall or doing whatever, right? I, I actually ended up sleeping more or wearing compression pants and doing things like that. Um, that really helped me. I changed the way I ate. I changed the way I um, lifted because I couldn't put the pressure on my body the way I used to. So I was started using more of a TRX or, you know, so it's figuring out those things um, that you might need to adjust. I think the other part is just the mental side. And it's just understanding that autoimmunes, they are flares. So they're a disease of flares. Like it's not every day, all day, all the time. It can come and hit you and last for a day. It could last for weeks. It could last for months. And I think, for me, the mental side has been the hardest to deal with. Um, but it's understanding that like, it's not going to define who you are. It's, it's just this thing that's there and you can choose how you want to 
react to it when it happens. And so for me, when flares started hitting, I remember initially I'd get so mad and upset and, and because I couldn't train. And eventually I just learned how to just give myself grace and say, you know what, tomorrow's a new day. And, you know, I'm going to try again tomorrow. And if the next day is still the same, I say, okay, I'm going to give myself grace and I'm going to try again the next day. And I think that gave me such a better peace of mind that there's nothing I can do. I can't control it. And so instead of really getting upset about it, I just really just said, okay, when it, when I can, I'm going to be the best version of myself today. And if that's just getting out of bed, well, then I did a great job. You know, if it's training hard, well, then awesome. I can do that. So that's kind of the mentality that I turned to. Through that experience, do you remember having any teammates that like stepped up for you during that time period or were like a good, uh, you know, support system and how can... Uh, players today be a good like support system for any teammates that are going through the same thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I had uh, multiple teammates. Um, when I was keeping it quiet, Christy Rampone was the only player that knew. I did tell her just because I felt like I couldn't keep it to myself. And she was a center back. I was a center mid. And there were definitely days where my I would be like, wide as a ghost. And she would look at me and be like, you're having a bad day. And I'd be like, yeah. She's like, I got your back. So it's just little things. It's just making sure that there's somebody for you to talk to. Um, so, you know, being a player and, and, you know, when I did become, or I came, I opened up about it, uh, it was players coming in my room and asking me more questions about what it is and how they can help. And I think just that support system is such an important piece to dealing with any disease. Um, and then, I mean, even Lindsay Tarpley, like she was cutting my meat for me one day at, at a, at a meal just because my hands hurt so bad. So it's just little things and knowing that you have people around you who are not going to ask questions. They're never going to know how you feel, but they're also, but they're going to be understand that you are going through something bad. And cause like we talked about, like you don't look sick. So there's so many people that are just like, ah, you're just tired today. You're just lazy or whatever. And it's like to have someone who just truly gets what you're going like just says okay I understand what you're going through I will never know what it feels like but I understand it I think that's huge yeah it's just such a nice reminder for younger players listening how important it is to have a support system and it's also okay to like hire help and talk to people and just get things off your chest because like you were saying the reason why you kept playing was because you came out about lupus and and having these issues and it allowed you it's like it probably opened so much it probably allowed you to breathe just free and, it's so free yeah. when you can finally just be who you are and not have to hide behind i mean i remember 2010 we were in qualifiers and i could feel it coming and we were at a team meal and i was like i have to get out of here before because it was so hot in mexico and that definitely was a trigger um, that I just was like, I have to get out of here before I can't actually even get out of my chair and going back. And then my roommate came coming in and me feeling like crap. And she's like, what is going on? And not to be able to tell her and, and share that with her to like, feel better. It was really hard. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Um, but we do remember, so we actually, I think we interviewed you in 2015 before the World Cup. And we just remember you being so positive. And I just feel like that definitely has pro probably helped you your whole career stay in the game. Like, how have you stayed so positive dealing with so many, you know, little <laughs> challenges or big challenges along the way? Some of it's faking it. I definitely <laughs> do. I'd say some of it's faking. It. I've had my moments of like, mental health issues and stuff like that. And I think for me, it's just, um, you know, dealing with adversity, I would say my number one, you know, trait for me or skill is resilience. And I don't know where it came from. I just felt like I just kept fighting, kept, I just always wanted to keep fighting. I never really wanted to ever give up on anything. Um, and so I would say that's kind of just where it comes from. I don't know if it's as a youth, like an older sister, we are always constantly battling each other to be better than one another. And so I got, you know, torn down a lot because she was definitely an athlete and smarter and everything than me. And it was me constantly kind of fighting to stay, stay up with her. Um, but, but yeah, I think even in 2015, I mean, that was a tough year to come back to play for, you know, 10 years as a starter. And then knowing that my role was going to be very different in that last world cup. But for me, it was just the act of, making it back, being part of that team, helping it grow and, and doing anything I can 
to get a World Cup win because it was my fourth. So I was like, can we please finally win one? <laughs> but um, but no, I think a lot of that just comes from, you know, controlling what I can control. And I learned that, you know, as I met my husband and talked to him a lot, like he was just like, you can't control everything, you know, and just control what you can control and have a positive attitude. And that's kind of what I kept trying to do. I think that's great advice for for anyone who's maybe their role on the team is changing or they're getting less time or they're not starting. You can't control everything. You just have to be able to control what you can control and the rest you have to kind of like leave to fate. Yeah, I would agree. Do you have any other advice for any young female athletes who are who want to play in college or who want to go pro or anything like that? Yeah, I would just, I, I always stick to that failure stuff too. You know, I think we're all so afraid to fail, which is normal. Um, but it's knowing that you probably are going to have to fail to actually really know what you can handle and and how to get out of it. Um, you know, we talked a lot about Mallory Swanson lately and how amazing she's doing. And, you know, she was so talented, so young and probably never failed at anything as a high school kid or even younger. And then she comes into the professional world and, and has, you know, a moment of hiccup. And it was almost a wake up call for her of like, OK, but it was OK because of the way she handled it. And she came out of that saying, like, yeah, I failed, but it doesn't define who I am right now. And I can choose which way I want to go with this. I could give up or I could fight harder. And man, she's come back full force. And this is what a great example of failing at something and, and working harder and learning from it and, and growing. But I, every successful athlete has probably a story of failing pretty badly at something. So when I talk to youth, I just say, you know what, take the risks and, and know that you might fail, but also have that positive attitude coming out of failing and see what you can do after it. Yeah, Mal's had such an inspirational story. It's it's awesome to see like where she is now. And um, I know you had a similar in 2003. I know you didn't originally think you were going to be on the roster and then you ended up being pulled on the roster. Not that that was the same situation, but that must have been a, a challenging time to to have that almost failure and and to stay positive and to stay ready. Like how, what was going on in your mind at that point? Was it just like, I'm going to just keep, working as hard as I can. Did you have moments of like, Oh, I had a lot of moments. <laughs> yeah. And that would probably be, I mean, I actually felt like I failed like that to me, like 2002, uh, I was on the San Diego spirit and I was going from, you know, starting and playing every minute of every game. I think I had the most minutes played in the year and a half. And then to like go and sit the bench. I mean, that's a failure to me of like what just happened. And yeah. I questioned whether I wanted to keep playing and, um, question, you know, I think in my head, I was like, Oh, I'm a pretty good player. Like, and then I was like, Oh, maybe I'm not. And that was a tough time for me. And then I kind of, again, just, I don't know where that positivity comes from of just wanting to prove myself. And, um, I came around and said, you know, I, I want to prove that I actually am a good player and, and took the new situation of playing in New York. Um, I got really fit. And so that made the game really fun. Um, and I enjoyed the team that I was on. Tom Sermani was a coach that came on at the perfect time, his mentality and his personality and the way he loved the game and just had fun with it. I truly enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, I think it, for me, it was the same thing. Like I had to fail to, it was a wake up call. Cause I think I was playing 90 minutes. I'm like, Oh, I'm fit enough. I'm good enough. I can play 90 minutes. And, you know, I went into the national team camp in 2002 as well. And or 2001 and got blown away and it was like oh this is the level got it okay I'm not even close to being there yet and so it was a chance for me to kind of reinvent myself in that off season and came into 03 and just again when you love what you're doing and you and you put all that effort in it makes it easy like soccer was easy for me that year and so when it came to trying out again right before the world cup I you know, didn't have a lot of the fear that all the other players were so stressed at, you know, in that last camp, I was just kind of there having fun and enjoying what I was doing. Um, and, and it worked out for me. So that was always a reminder when things got stressed on the national team and you're like, oh my gosh, am I going to make this world cup? Or am I going to make this Olympics? I always tried to go back to that feeling of like, I'm doing this because I love it. And 
I'm going to just continue to work hard and again, control the things I can control. It sounds so simple, but I feel like so many people struggle to play without fear. And we've talked to so many players and it's like, as soon as you, it clicks and you just play and have fun, it's like, ugh, like your game. Don't you wish you could just like, like put it in a bag and grab it and pull it back out? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but like it does, it disappears. And then you're like, well, how do I get it back? Yep. <laughs> and, you know, and when it's there, you're like, okay, it's great. And you're not thinking and you're not, you know, you're really not thinking about anything. You're just out there. And I, that was one thing I definitely said every time I walked onto the field, I'd be in the tunnel and I'd like turn my brain off. I'd just say, turn it off and just play. Mm -hmm. I love that. And last question, we just love to know what, what are your hopes for the women's game in the next five, 10, 15 years? What do you hope to see happen in, in just in the U S in the NWSL or just in general, since we've been yeah. talking about the other teams as well? Um, let's see. Well, as a, as a whole, um, continue to see the game just evolve. Um, I would say the players now, um, are way better than I was <laughs> um and just continuing to see the level grow and but also just the equal pay and making sure that they're in a scenario that they can do this for a living and when they're retired they can be done um and not have to stress about what's next I think that would be a, a huge thing for me to see um and then just but or if they if you know I think for the NWSL I would say creating an environment that they can grow more than just a soccer player. Um, I think it would be great too, that they can make the kind of money that they could do this for a long time, but there's also a lot of players that come in for a year or two and, and then move on. And it, it what are we doing for those players? You know, um, like I'm just starting my own company. It's called um, ethos mentality group. And the, it's a program called athletes redefined and it's helping athletes transition out of sports. And so it's not just for soccer, but it's giving these athletes access to, you know, what's next and preparing them just like they prepared their whole life to play soccer. How can we, while they're playing, how can we continue to prepare them for life after soccer and not just leave them hanging? I think that's what I love about angel city is that once they're done, they're they're gonna still be a part of the you know Angel City family and and really they're helping them be more holistically like ready for everything else too. Shannon, where was your business when we graduated from college? Like <laughs> when I graduated, when I we, finished, we we felt some type of way. I will never forget. It's like something that it's they they literally do not prepare you when you stop playing. Like they don't. The exit interview with the, with the school is like, how did we're, how's the faculty? Great. And then that's it. Like, it's so crazy how there's just no support. So thank you so much for yeah. doing what you're doing. And please send us the information so we can put it in the description of the podcast because it's so important. Okay. I will. Out of the game. It is. It's just, you know, I'm, I went through a lot. I mean, you know, I retired when I was 38 years old and it's like, oh, now I got to go find a job. Okay. I'm having kids now because I waited my whole career. And then I'm going to, on top of that, try to get into a job that, you know, I have no real skills for is what I thought. Right. And, and how do you do that? And just the identity. I think that's the one thing we focus on a lot is, you know, we all, this is our whole identity is to be an athlete. Same thing when you're getting out of college. So we're working with college kids as well. So It'll be fun. I'm excited about it. I think it's needed. And uh, I would love to send it to you guys to promote it a little bit more. That'd be amazing. Awesome. Yeah, that would be great. I'm sure a lot of people listening would love to see that. Um, guys, any other questions before we do rapid fire? We call it rapid. It's slow burning. You can take your time. <laughs> I'm the worst at this. It's just fun. Slow question. burning. I can think about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your go-to coffee order? Oh, um, it's an Americano with almond milk. Nice. What is your favorite team to watch? I still love Man U. I know. They're doing well this year, so that's good. <laughs> uh, who's your favorite player to watch? But it could be across any sport. It can be across any sport. Okay. Um, I would say LeBron. Uh, favorite boots or sneakers? Ooh. Or both. Well, Nikes, are you saying like brand? Well, and like, do you have a specific one that you love? 
Um. Yeah, when you were playing, were you like superstitious about a type of cleat? I actually just did that the the tempo. Like it fit me. I was like not flashy. I was it, it never fails. It's crazy how they do those. Like, you, they're the reliable one, right? Like I was like, okay, that fits me. <laughs> okay, what actress would play you in a movie? Oh. Hmm. Can I just guess who I want to play me? <laughs> Even if they yeah. don't Zoe Saldana? Oh, I mean, she's right. amazing. <laughs> yeah. All right, what was your last funny Google search? Oh, geez. Funny? Or just or, I, in my opinion, they're all stupid for yeah. me. Like I'm <laughs> I'm researching the stupidest questions. I'm like, I should know the answer to this. You really want to know what I just researched? Yeah. <laughs> How to turn my phone ringer off on my computer because I didn't want it to go off during this. It does it every time I'm on Zoom. I still haven't time. figured out how to turn mine yeah. off. Oh, I just figured it out. Yep. It's on your it's phone. Good. You don't even do it you on guys, your I haven't had sound on my phone in like the past five years. I, I don't hear my phone ring. Nothing. <laughs> Is that on purpose? or <laughs> yeah, On purpose. Missed call. It's fine. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I'll call them back. Yeah, it happens every time and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And before this, I was like, I need to just Google this and how do I do this? So I'm surprised it didn't happen to me while we were in the middle of this whole thing. Um, if you had a sandwich named after you, what would be on it? Oh, a sandwich named after me. Um, what are my favorite sandwiches? I probably am like my just ham and cheese, like, but melted, toasted. Mm -hmm. Nice. That sounds good. Yeah. All right. Last bacon, question. avocado. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. What is your biggest soccer girl problem? Uh, my biggest soccer girl problem is that for a long time, I did not know how to do my own French braid. And that was I what I wore it. every time. And so I had to actually learn how to do my own hair. <laughs> I was going to say, who did it for you for so long? <laughs> uh, in college, I had Cindy Dawes and then May Otis Erickson do it for me. And then Piercy. Christy Rampone did mm -hmm. it for me, but then she got really busy and then she had her own things to prepare. So I was like, <laughs> crap, I have to learn how to do my own hair. Shannon actually did braids all the time and Shannon would do my hair and I would be like, I don't like it. And I would take it out. You were my worst client. <laughs> my worst client. I'm so sorry. You're I like, great. So I just wasted busy. my time. Thanks. I appreciate yeah. it. Every <laughs> team hair braider has arthritis now for sure. Cause you used to do like 10 people's braids. Right, you would like kind of come in and like come in line. Oh my god, that's yep. great! So funny. <laughs> that is a good one. We haven't heard that one. That's a really good one. I like that. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for coming on. It was great to chat with you again, and we're so excited to continue to watch all of your endeavors. Um, we'll definitely get the link from you about your company, um, and hopefully, we get to see you at a game soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. You guys, you guys are the best. All right, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, you too. Bye, guys. Soccer girls, you know we got some problems. So tune in, no way we talk, I don't stop them. We may laugh, we may learn, we might be your king.